Hello, and welcome to the show Gold Squadron Gays. It's the podcast where two Star Wars loving gays break down each episode of their favorite Star Wars TV shows while also being gay as hell. I'm your host, Bradley Brower. And I'm Charles Rogers. And today we have our first ever guest. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Clayton Trimlison. And it's not the only name that Clayton uses. Do you want to it, introduce your other name? It is not. I am also an Atlanta-based drag queen by the name of Hydra. Just Hydra, no last name. <laughs> some, Although, some, people, some people make it work. Some people make the no last name work. Hydra here is is somebody that I've worked. I'll jump back and forth between using Clayton and Hydra because I can't stop calling her Hydra. <laughs> go, go for uh, it. <laughs> somebody that that I've been backstage with and sort of has been my window into the drag world. So it's a need to get her on this show because she's also a huge Star Wars fan. Now, here's the question I have for you. Have you, and I know I've asked you this off the show, have you considered doing Star Wars drag before? Yes, um, and I mean, I mean, we have talked in a little bit of detail about this. Um, I wanted to do a few looks, like um, more of the like when I've seen the Twi'lek, <clears throat> excuse me, the Twi'lek cosplay uh, that I would see online. That always was just like, God, I could totally rock that look, like, and I feel like I could do it really well. Um, I think we talked about uh, doing uh, what was the other one that we wanted to do? Juhani from uh, Star Wars: yep. the, uh, the Knights of the Old Republic. I definitely would love to tackle that. The number one on my list that I want to do, and it's probably going to be the first one that I really try to attempt, is uh, Darth Talon. Like, so, yeah. So for Bradley, heard... who probably doesn't know who that is, <laughs> right. who is who is Darth Talon? I know Darth... who Darth Talon is. Right. Yeah, so explain. Darth Talon's a, a badass, you know, red tattooed Twi'lek Sith Lord um, from the comics, like, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and... So I've always just seen uh, the visuals of her and through the comics and all the different interpretations. And I just thought she looked like a badass, like villain bitch. And you know, us gays, we love a strong villainous bitch. Like that's just, that's how we roll. And um, seeing her interpretations and see people do her in cosplay. um, I'm just like, Oh, I could totally do that. And I could do it better than those, you know, those, those little bitches doing the cosplay. (laughs) Now, uh, yeah. what, what what sort of routine would you even do for that? Because I'm I'm sitting here thinking like, Darth Talon, you can't really do the Jabba's Palace dance for. <laughs> no, and well, I mean, Talon would probably you know, cl- kill the shit out of Jabba the Hutt. Like, you know, I don't think she'd submit to no man or thing, no hut, no. Uh, but you know how I thought about introducing that concept at a pageant, like if I were to do. If I had like an open world like uh, presentation category for a pageant, I would literally make sure I had, you know, a real good quality lightsaber with a red crystal and probably go out in like the traditional, very dark Sith robe attire and do this, you know, and you know, you know how I like reveals because you know how we, how we did it. Like, and Bradley, do, did, did you did you see any of Dragnificent, Bradley? Have, were you around for that show back in 20, late 2016, early 2017 when Hydra was in it? Uh, no, I've never seen that show, so I don't know anything about I don't that. Know if, I don't know if they're doing it anymore since the, the place that normally hosted it shut down, but uh, yes, I'm just a big fan again. of reveals. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, they'll do it again once uh, Future opens in Atlanta, but I was the last winner um, when Jungle was still open because that next year in November, they, they closed down Jungle. Uh, but I, I totally am intent on... Um, doing like more star wars drag uh Dar- darth talon is just at the top of my list like you know because i've already mapped it out how i want to do it how i want it presented who i'm going to get to do the like either bodysuit or body painting uh charles that you know titus um, i do like yeah do. Titus, da- titus davis um amazingly talented so i already know he's the first person i'm going to go to for the body painting and probably the makeup too because he can paint like no one's business and he taught me makeup when i first started drag so I've got a big plan for how to do it and how it's going to, you know, make everyone, you know, just gag. So I am excited the, for that. The nice thing about Atlanta is, and it's something I found, you know, being backstage at Dragnificent for, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks, the level of like just homegrown talent that's in Atlanta for doing drag never fails to blow me away. It's consistently impressive 
just if you know you know where to look for people, the type of people you can pull together to collaborate and make something really cool. I would be interested because Star Wars drag is not the first thing I think of when I think of Atlanta drag. So it would be interesting to see it there as opposed to we were talking, Bradley and I, on, on the pilot episode about San Francisco. Apparently there's a Star Wars drag show in San Francisco. So it'd be interesting to see it play in Atlanta. Yeah, no, I, I think we talked about the San Francisco uh, Star Wars show. I have yet to go to, go to that. Um, although I was just in San Francisco and they were doing an outdoor drag show and the wind and the cold. Oh God, it was so cold uh, with the wind chill. But they were doing a show outside and outdoor dining and everything. But, you know, I didn't catch the the show itself and definitely didn't catch the Star Wars show, um, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, there's a, a whole mess of a variety of talent in Atlanta drag. And I mean, you go north, south, you know, east, west Atlanta, whichever neighborhood you go to, you're going to find a whole cluster of talented queens, like, and each one really good at something else. So it's always fun when you have those rare events um, where they bring all facets of Atlanta drag together. When they do that, I think you can create the environment to do like more stuff like we would like to see, which is Star Wars drag. Um, so I've had the plans to do it. So it's just about the right timing <laughs> to come out and the money to make sure I have everything, you know, of quality. So wait until wait until after the pandemic. I'll I'll fly in to see it. I'll crash on Bradley's couch. He doesn't right. know that I'm planning to do that yet. <laughs> right, and no. that, that's, that's, that's a lot. Of it. Do. A lot of it is planning. You know, hey, post pandemic when things are more normal, I have all right. these plans. So it's just a whole Rolodex and stash of stuff I want to do. Yeah, I have a lot of plans. You know, just to get way more involved in the Atlanta community for drag, and that definitely something that I'm going to bring into the fold is you know more of the Star Wars element. And deviating from women entirely, as I'm pretty sure that this upcoming episode features none of them. <laughs> no women whatsoever. Yeah. Pretty exactly none. Yeah. <laughs> that we uh, we're just gonna hop in, rip it apart like a couple of gays at brunch. God. All right. <laughs> I miss brunch. I miss brunch so much. This week, uh, we take a look at uh, The Mandalorian Season 1, Episode 2, titled The Child. Uh, target in hand, The Mandalorian must now contend with scavengers. Really, The Child should be the name of the show because that's what we're here to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after. We all yeah. know it. It's so true. Especially this episode. We're just like, Every, every moment you can see him. Because, you know, if you go back, you think about it. We had a whole week to process the child, right? And mm-hmm. then after the first episode. So we had a whole week to be like, oh my God, they finally, or like, you know, they did it. They did a baby Yoda. And then nobody knew what to expect after. So this was a huge buildup to this week because everybody was like, oh my God, what are they going to do with this thing? Yeah, well, no one saw that coming. Like, you know, <laughs> and no, none of it leaked. Like, so... No. I mean, literally, you got to the end of that episode and you're just like, oh, well, it's a baby Yoda. And then the whole internet explodes until the very next episode comes out. And everyone's like, why is there not another episode? They're doing weekly, weekly releases. I hate this. I need more baby Yoda. And then right. luckily, We're- episode two is just showing you how cute and adorable baby Yoda is for like 90% of it. I thought it was a fake. So I, I as we know didn't watch the Mandalorian the first three or four episodes as they were airing. Cause I was in the middle of my giant pre rise of Skywalker rewatch. I thought the first time somebody said there is a baby Yoda, I was <laughs> like, you're lying to me. There's no <laughs> way this is the big episode one reveal. You're all freaking out about. And then I saw a picture on Twitter. I was like, Oh, <laughs> Oh, they actually did do baby yoda <laughs> right okay you're like you're full of it and then like oh no they they actually did that like oh shit <laughs> but it's interesting you bring up episodically because at time of recording uh wandavision is currently airing and i've been hearing some criticism of wandavision that they're like oh they should have released it all as one mm-hmm. and you know, I disagree, and I disagree for the same reason. I think that episodic works for The Mandalorian. That mm-hmm. both of these shows, I think people with binging have just kind of forgotten how to watch how we used to watch episodic TV. Right, they're spoiled. Yeah, you, you get I, it all in one, and then you forget about it. With The Mandalorian, maybe it wouldn't have become such a cultural zeitgeist 
if we hadn't been able to follow it week to week to week and have these conversations about it, uh, like right. we're retroactively doing, of course, when the new seasons are right. dropping, we will go in and do this as right. they're airing. Right. Yeah. And I think they understand that part of it. Like they wanted to bring back the more episodic format so that, you know, things like this can be a thing. People can talk about it. More buzz is built up. Do a bunch of, you know, like ads, campaigning, et cetera. They, I mean, they make a ton of money, obviously, like are not blind to the benefits of doing an episodic. There's a definite, definite benefit for them to do it, even though it drives us nuts because we're so accustomed to the binge dump that we've done, that we've been doing ever since Netflix and entered the fray. Because now everyone wants to just throw their shows out there. Yeah. And I think that one interesting thing is I'll, I'll log into Disney Plus, but Disney Plus is not the type of thing that I just kind of log into. I'll, I'll log in to watch these episodes for the recaps and then, you know, maybe I'll log in to watch WandaVision and, you know, while I'm there, maybe I'll put something else on. So I end up spending like hours on this app that I opened up to watch just one thing. Mm-hmm. Right. That's how they get you. Well, yeah, they put Baby Yoda on there. They got every gay man's money the second they went. You can have Baby Yoda and you can have Scarlet Witch. And that Period. is all the sale that you need right. to get gays to watch your app. Yeah. Um, and so in the first scene, we get Mando walking with Baby Yoda. This is actually the first time we get him, or I guess floating Baby Yoda, because he's in his little, uh-huh. you know, carrying pram thing thing which is honestly the whole character is in the pram you know like i think uh, for a while there people were like that is part of baby yoda i guess like you knew that he was a little (laughs) you know yoda but he's in this little like carrying baby case like so it's i don't know he just looks so cute when he's floating next to him and he's just like coming along It, it helps with like the the dad vibes of like the dad with his, you know, kid in the, it's almost kind of a crib meets like one of those harnesses that dads wear where they're carrying their kid around, which as you Are get Are we talking older, about real dad harnesses or like leather dad harnesses? So. <laughs> the real ones. <laughs> no, come on. I the real ones, the there. ones that, that start fun. doing things to you when you uh, enter your, your 30s. Yeah, and you start going, <laughs> suddenly I'm finding the ability to raise a child very attractive. Can't right? relate. <laughs> I do want to talk about the, fir- the very first shot of the episode, because I took a note of this. Oh, yeah. The very first shot of the episode with the lizard, and how seamlessly, oh. like, the lizard's mm-hmm. out, and then back, and then Mando's foot. Like, it all feels like one coherent shot, like they actually had the lizard on set, even though the yeah. lizard just probably not on set i don't know how they shot it wait you're telling me that wasn't a real lizard uh, <laughs> bradley not everything in star wars is real I gas disagree. gay gas <laughs> <laughs> sometimes sometimes they add things in with the computer mm. you just don't notice because it's not 1999 anymore right well, what was not added to the thing. computer uh, was uh, he gets attacked by basic, I don't even know what they're called. I mean, I know. Trandoshans. Trandoshans. Yeah. I, yep. I was trying to remember what the name of the alien was called because I was like, he got attacked by Bosk. Um, <laughs> yeah, Bosk. Saw, yeah, Trando, he's a Trandoshan, and, but those things are vicious. Those things, uh, their whole species, essentially, all we've seen of them really yeah. across everything has portrayed them as hunters they're either bounty hunters or they're actual hunters mm-hmm. and the thing is in legends i didn't even have to take notes in this i just know it because kaiser right. fest is one of my favorite older public characters in legends their whole thing is that they worship a deity called the scorekeeper mm-hmm. and their whole life's mission is to gain points to get the scorekeeper's favor And so that's why most of them will be bounty hunters or there'll be some sort of hunter because their thing is that they acquire these points to please their goddess. I don't know if that's the same thing in canon. I mean, I I see why it's legends now, because that's dumb. (laughs) <laughs> i'm just like yeah. a scorekeeping religion right it's a scorekeeping religion i don't think they're bringing that back <laughs> for being honest i mean you know doing things to gain the favor of a deity and like who, uh, who would have ever thought of that like right mm. at least they have it in quantifiable points that's true it makes sense yeah. i can follow this 
I'm like that I could actually probably get behind. I'm like, oh, you're at like negative 20 points. Like, yeah, have fun in, you know, purgatory. Like, <laughs> you know. Have fun in lizard hell, which is where that <laughs> one that they probably got disintegrated went. Now, a little lizard hell is probably a goal. Extra lizard hell is like, you know, probably the bad place. Well, it relates to a meme I shared that I got yelled at for sharing, you know, a few days, a couple days ago. The gays on Facebook will yell at you for sharing anything. This is why I exclusively talk about Star Wars. Right. Oh, oh, it wasn't the gays. It was, you know, my very conservative parents. And I'm like, oh, oops. Oh, yikes. <laughs> yeah, that, that disintegrator doesn't fuck around, though. This is, and this is, I took a note, this is the first time I think we've seen it actually disintegrate. Yeah. We see it do it a yep. lot this episode, but last Literally. one, he just shocked the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know what the Never rules heard. are on that, because watching this, it, like, okay, so he does it, like, once or twice, I think, in, the, in this scene. Um, but I'm not to jump ahead, but later on, we do see him insert some kind of capsule or something into Uh his gun. So it it seems like it has a limit to it. It's some kind of like, I only have so many disintegrating shots. You know what I mean? So that that not to, again, jump forward, but like, which he could have just used to stop something later on in the episode. He could have just disintegrated. (laughs) But There's a lot of points in this episode where the plot could have been avoided by doing one or two things differently. Yeah. Of course, if they did things differently, there wouldn't be an episode. Of course. And it would have been an even shorter episode if he had just disintegrated (laughs) everybody. (laughs) Right? He tried. Well, and we know too from Empire Strikes Back, we do know Vader has the line on when he's talking to Boba Fett where he says, no disintegrations. And I always interpreted that as just in in general to everybody, but he happens to be facing Fett at the time. Right. But now we know exactly what the disintegrator rifle does and why he's saying that, what he doesn't want him to use. Yeah. I never even thought about that. I'm just yeah. like, oh, it's about the Fed. Yeah, he'll just run disintegrate people. And now putting it in context with the actual <laughs> disintegrator rifle, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, that, that line makes a lot more sense now. And there's, there's a little bit later on where Mando talks about refusing to drop the rifle because weapons are part of his religion, which leads uh-huh. me to believe this is a Mandalorian thing. Right. to carry these disintegrator rifles even though we've never seen a rifle but in rebels we have seen disintegrations happen well i know the mandalorians like were known at least um if you go back to and, and like when you played the knights of the old republic games the mandalorians blaster you know uh wares were you know second to none like so it would not surprise me that mandalorians were the ones that conceived you know uh, the, of the disintegrator rifle because you know they would have the blasters like the mandalorian rippers and all these other off-brand blasters that would just kill the hell out of you um so it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me they also built the basilisk war droids mm. which the basilisk war droids <laughs> I, I have I to see like, one of those i feel like maybe Maybe you could have added a few less guns to the front of this thing, Mandalorians. Nope. <laughs> yeah, there's a zero cock- cockpit space saved like from three people because the rest of it is literally just guns. <laughs> like they literally put guns. a U.S. battleship and every gun in America in a war droid. Like that is the Basilisk war droid. The Mandalorians, big, big proponent of just throwing guns on everything. But yeah, that disintegrator, I believe this is the first disintegration we've seen on the show. Right. It won't was. be the last, I think. No, because you only there. have to wait two minutes and then it <laughs> right. again because... Uh, and he picks off a bunch of them. Well, I I mean, they're in the next scene, technically he's fixing his like um, his armor from the battle or I guess he's healing uh, himself now, or something. He gets cut or something. Yeah. Now, before, before we jump into that, I do want to follow up on one thing from last week. Oh, yes. Is that uh, I went and looked up how the tracking fobs work. Because it's important to the Trandoshan oh, scene that there's one yes, that you're drops, right, you're right. Uh-huh. and the implication being these are more bounty hunters that were sent up. So I looked up exactly how a tracking fob works. Okay. What happens with a tracking fob is that when you're given one, you're given by the client, you're given a few things. You're given the puck, which is the wanted poster that we saw in episode one. You're giving the tracking fob, and you're given a chain code. Remember, they talked about the chain code and how they could only give him part of the chain code right Uh well the reason the chain code is so important is that the chain code is the specs for the target so it's not actually tracking the target themselves it's track it's a short range tracker that actually tracks the specs that the target would have 
So in my case, if someone were to go after me, what they would do is they would program a track a chain code that just says, you know, my name. And then like six foot tall, 150 pounds at age years old. I'm not going to say it on a show that's listened to by gay people. <laughs> uh, you know, my basic build and basically information about me and the tracking fob would scan in a short range area individuals who might meet that criteria. I see. So that's actually how the tracking fobs work. I thought they were magic hot and cold, but actually, no, it turns out they did put some thought into this. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, something about me thought it was like, you know, blood samples or something. I was always curious about how they were able to track them. But I'm guessing these things uh, can track. I mean, uh, that they'll give off signals for multiple people. So I guess mm -hmm. you have to weed them out, you know, depending on the specs of the target. Well, Biota being the, uh, the probably the most unique target you know, is an easy find, you know, I mean, because there's so few of his species, like, you know, in the regular, in the known Star Wars universe, like, you just, you don't see them. This is the fourth of Yoda species that we've ever seen, two of them decanonized, uh, but they do only give them the age, so they only give him the age, but I thought it was interesting, because I looked up after that week, I was like, how do these things work? This is effectively how they work, is they're tracking not your like your blood or anything but they're tracking your specs and they're just saying here are people that's why they need a physical bounty hunter to go and do it to actually do the act of tracking them down because you've got to account for that error in there somewhere like if you have a crowd of people it's going to show you multiple right it's going to work in multiple directions because there may be multiple people you know if you go to a gay brunch in atlanta with specs like mine you're going to trigger basically every person there <laughs> they're all lying about their age too i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> i'll lie about my weight for sure especially post covid sorry i wanted to bring up the tracking fobs before we moved on to the next scene no you're fine i actually this that, is it's good to know that um yeah i want i wanted to hear about that there's some there's some explanation into Maybe the show could have explained it a little bit better or more right. likely this is just for people like me right. who really care about this stuff, wanting to go and look for it. Exactly. Um, but moving on to the next scene, uh, this is this one's really fast, so we don't have to spend too much time on it. But Mando's sitting there because I guess he got cut by one of the vibrating blades um, that one of the Trandoshans used. Um, kind of cut him a little bit, so he's kind of like, I guess he's not soldering himself, but you know what I mean? Like he's kind of closing up the wound, essentially. Cauterizing Cauterizing, you're right. Baby Yoda wants to help. He just wants to come over there and touch his wound <laughs> and make it feel better. Which we will yeah. know from later in the series does have a purpose. Right. I know a lot of this episode is just highlighting on how adorable Baby Yoda is. <laughs> like, look at this child. Right. Like, you know, that's the episode name. So, I mean, Disney is literally just like milking it for everything it's worth because I think they just low-key knew they would break the internet with the first episode. Yep. And so this scene included is just setting up like look how adorable <laughs> and what highlighted that for me was because i watch most everything with subtitles now because i, I don't know i'm getting old and Same. so I, I would constantly just giggle whenever like you know baby yoda would do anything the subtitle down below is child cooing and i'm just like <laughs> that's the most adorable a, a child cooing like yeah. the most adorable thing in the planet like <laughs> so every time i see child cooing i'm just like oh my god like it's so adorable and literally almost every shot of baby yoda doing anything he's just like ah, like little coo like and then and the little subtitles and then i just you know fawn over it you know like any gay man would and we are seeing mando kind of start to even in this early scene the reason that he's starting to come around on baby yoda is because he's having to spend so much time with him and so much of this episode highlights the two spending all this time together, leading down his eventual choices he will make later on in the show. Uh, I did also note that uh, dad vibes are extremely low-key sexy to me. And I did not uh, really process that as a thing that I'm like, oh, I kind of find this fully armored guy more attractive now. <laughs> I already thought the fully armored guy was attractive, but this is just helping and I don't know why. <laughs> You're going to look for a fully armored guy in the back room of Heretic now. Hey, if you show up to the club in full Mandalorian armor, 
Like, I don't care what you do or who you are. I'm buying you a drink and you're not taking the armor off. Oh, I, yeah, no, I think we'd all hit it probably. So, because <laughs> we know we'll never, he'll never take, well, at least in that particular one, he wouldn't take his helmet off. So, <laughs> nope. I don't have to know what you look like. You can look like Pedro Pascal, which, which is fine. Which is fine. You're, as long as I can't see your face, you're anybody I want. This, this is a fact. Now, uh, well, before, well, before y'all want to jump ahead of the scene, the end of that scene, you know, when he puts the child back in the carrier so innocently and delicately, again, highlighting the cuteness. But, like, once he shuts that and they transition to the next scene, like, they start the music, like, that brass, just um, whole moment happens, like, in the, in the score and the music. And, you know, more about my background I didn't talk about is that I was a music major at college trumpet player i teach college band high school bands brass pedagogy specialist so i have a huge i got a huge brass player boner for that moment <laughs> as soon as he put trump baby, boner. Baby, right trump boner yeah whatever and uh, so yeah band too. i know all the insults <laughs> yeah we're all a bunch of horny band geeks that like star wars so here we are but that moment like was probably my first moment of like true appreciation i'm like okay this dude like that's doing the music for the show is everything uh it's like uh, it was ludwig um, ludwig Jorwinson. i wasn't sure about the the emphasis um on the name but my friend anthony parther out who's actually out in la too he you know conducts the san bernardino symphony and he worked on the music for this mm. so just highlighting that the end of this scene in particular was like my moment of like this music is the shit like the whole score so the whole rest of the series i'm just like i love this music i love everything about it but that moment was when it, when it started for me i fell in love with the score with the uh, with the, the the composer for black panther when he did the music for black panther that was when we made that was what made me sit up and go wow this guy is something really talented so i was really excited uh-huh he was going to do Mandalorian and he's really knocked it out of the park it's just incredible the way he's created these Star Wars themes and later on you see there would be key moments where it would be very very easy for him to insert the traditional John Williams motifs and he rarely if ever does it's so minimalist you know it's not you know overly bombastic like with you know giant you know 100 piece orchestras the maximum studio um orchestra doing that is probably about 40 50 people and you know it just the way that it was orchestrated was so effective and especially the credit scene like you know the opening and the endings is is just now so iconic like you know like that's the mandalorian this is the mandalorian like, but you know the, the, his incorporation of brass fanfares in, in between throughout different episodes that moment in particular where it's just i, I kind of relate it to uh mars like you know bringer of war like from the, like, the planet symphonies and everything um so that's kind of like how i kind of related it to it's just this that bombastic big bomb big beautiful chords so i loved it I I did Jupiter, the bringer of jollity in okay. high school, and I actually did the bassoon solo in it. So I'm I'm a big fan. And now that you mention it kind of draws on that, I do see it, especially with Mario's Bringer of War mm-hmm. and those big like punch moments. Like clearly, clearly this composer is a guy who has studied the classics and knows what he's doing. And yeah, I hadn't even taken note of the music because the no- music kind of it's doing its job so well it fades into the background oh i will be the one to talk about it because like i'll get distracted from the plot and i'm just like this score is lit <laughs> like, <laughs> like especially if it's a good brass moment like and they're just going ham i will appreciate the hell out of it and i'm like oh wait what was happening in the show that's me so <laughs> hydra's, hydra's the one in the bar like getting down to the brass band like it's bumping club music I would like if they did a you know circuit remix to like a fucking ska band or you know the Canadian brass like I'd be I'd be into it and I would I would do a whole production based around it if I if I could. Um. So after he plays with Baby Yoda in his little carrier case, uh, we jump to the next scene where he is getting to his ship and he sees Jawas taking it apart. So is there like a law of salvage in this universe? Like, can they do that? Can I mean, they just I guess so. find a ship and be like, well, the ship has been here for less than a, a week, uh, but I guess it's ours now. I mean, you know, Jawas like, are expert scavengers, and they've been around for 
God knows how long. I mean, they have it figured out to a science. And they move in a, a rolling fortress, which is near impenetrable. I mean, ap- apart from it's like always moving and you can never track, or well, you never guess where they're going to end up. So they pretty much operate with near impunity on those uh, desert-like planets. So they come across a random ship. They're like, yeah, we're going to take this shit. And then if you want to come and get it later, you know, we'll bargain with you for, you know, X, Y, and Z, because that's how they build the arsenal of what to trade with. It's interesting you mentioned desert-like planets, because this, to my knowledge, in canon, now I, I, would, I would have to go and look this up, but to my knowledge in the Disney canon, this is the first time we've seen Jawa somewhere other than Tatooine. Correct. And in, at least in Legends, the sand crawlers in particular were a Tatooine specific thing because they were left behind by the Zerka Corporation and other mining corporations that came to the planet, tried to exploit it for resources, discovered there are no resources on Tatooine because Tatooine sucks hard. Oh, you're and right. Just left them behind. Mm. And we do see some Jawas in legend that have, you know, migrated out space faring. But this is the first time we've seen both in canon, both Jawas. And I believe it's the first time ever that we've seen a sand crawler, like a true Jawa sand crawler, that's made the move to another planet. So it brings up a lot of implications about the Jawas that they may not be as, you know, simple. Simple, yeah, as as we're led (laughs) to believe. No, I've always I've always thought that they were a very sophisticated, um, pack-minded species. Like, you know, they're incredibly clever and they know how to get what they want. So is it it's not beyond comprehension that they are able to, you know, on at least on a smaller scale, you know, perform interstellar travel. I mean, we don't know how far away this planet was from Tatooine. At least I don't know off the top of my head. Once he notices the Jawas, uh, he starts disintegrating them with his disintegrating ray and uh, starts to chase after them because they're, they're freaking out and running away. Okay, so the single, probably the single funniest meme to come out of this episode is... Like having Mando, like, you know, just perched up in cyber position with Baby Yoda right next to him. And they made, they screenshotted that, turned it into a meme. Um, I think the first one that I saw was like the caption was just like me watching my boyfriend beat the boss in a video game that I couldn't <laughs> beat. And then it goes to Baby Yoda and he's like, yes, die, trash. <laughs> <laughs> sure and I thought it. that was the single funniest thing because I know good and well that that whole scene is, you know, Mando disintegrating Jawas left and right. And Baby Yoda is just like reveling in the chaos and death. <laughs> the juxtaposition of the, the, the dynamic works so well because it's a juxtaposition between this stone cold, literally like faceless killer and Baby Yoda, Earth's cutest thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there were there was a handful of memes that we could reference, but like that was the funnier one. You know, a cold, faceless killer next to the most adorable thing in the universe, just sitting there enjoying it. Like, mm. <laughs> yeah, is that, a foresh- is that a foreshadowing that maybe he'll go to the dark side because you know he enjoyed watching little tiny Jawas be disintegrated? Who knows? Right. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've I've seen couples around LA and Atlanta like that. So yeah, you know, or one of them's or one of them's like this super, super closed off, and then the other one's like the most bubbly person you've ever met in your life. It's, oh, just, yeah, it's a facts. dynamic that happens sometimes. Not even in this context, but even like walking down and seeing gay couples wandered around. Right. It's a funny dynamic. It's just a hilarious dynamic, whether it's in a relationship or a friendship or a parent-child relationship. And this show leans into it so well. And then um, while he's chasing them, uh, they you know they're opening up the little panels uh, in the crawler and they keep throwing stuff <laughs> at him. And then eventually he gets to the top because he's so successful. And then they just stun gun him and then he falls just hard. Did anyone a- else get serious Indiana Jones tank scene vibes from this? No. Or was that just me? The Indiana Jones, the tank scene from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Oh, I kind um, of got those same vibes. Oh. Yeah, I've seen all the movies, like, and I, I know I've seen Last Crusade. No, but mine doesn't, my mind didn't go straight there. I probably have to go back to Last Crusade so I can see the, see the parallels again. Right. So you're alone in this, old man. Yeah. So. I'm, <laughs> I usually am. I'm perpetually alone. Here he is. Same. 
no. That's why the, I have a Star Wars podcast. Uh, the thing, well, the thing I appreciated about, yeah, after he started chasing the crawler, you know, because he spent, you know, the first part of that scene just completely picking them off and they're all freaking out like, holy shit, like, right. our they're people are back in kind of thin air. <laughs> like, and they're just getting their shit wrecked. And um, I mean, I put my notes, I, I put my notes here that, that, you know, it was just, it's funny to me because Mando starts out the scene just completely wrecking them, you know, going ham with the disintegrator rifle. And he finally makes his way up to the top of the, the sand crawler by the, by the will of God and, you know, the strength of his convictions. And all along the way, just these tiny little funny moments with the Jawas, like right before he gets up there, he literally... You know, they think they got him, he grabs that Jawa by the scruff and just throws Bro, him over. Throws him and he just end. screams in his little cute little Jawa voice, like, ah! I was... know he's going to his death, but it's just so cute. Like, <laughs> I was... even they're dying is adorable. Ex- I, yeah, I've always thought the Jawas were one of the more adorable things in a Star Wars universe. And then, you know, Baby Yoda came. They're also presented in A New Hope when we see them for the first time as almost kind of more frightening so they're you know r2's out there and they're these jawas that ambush him and the sand crawler is scary and it's got the droids yeah. in there and it's almost like dark and creepy and then we see them get to the lars for get to the lars farm then they're just like running around being hilariously adorable like trying to sell owen on these droids and you're like mm-hmm. I don't know how to feel about these things. It's the same thing with the Ewoks. The Ewoks are adorable. The Ewoks also eat people. That's yeah, that's the thing because I think I remember like that the Jawas are actually like really vicious. Like you don't ever see their faces, but I feel like I remember someone did a rendering of what their faces actually look like, and they had like sharp teeth and like something else. I I think it was the Jawas. I could be mistaken. Um, but you know, they're always hooded and they're, you just see their eyes. That's it. Like, so when they take their hoods off, like I I remember someone did a rendering of it and they're just like heinously like ugly. And after that, I'm like, I really glad I don't see them like that all the time. So I can still think they're cute. The sand crawler chase takes up, you know, it's a, it's a little longer than I remember it being the first time I watched the episode, but it's also a lot more engaging than the yeah. first time because the jaw is popping out of the little things and him having to move back and forth and like he's kicking them at one point and they can just pop out of nowhere i remember thinking right. man i hope there is a level based around i know there won't be but man i hope there's a level based around this in the new lego game that's coming out in spring because that would make a really interesting one going up the side of the sand crawler with them popping out or even just a level in something in general maybe that would that would be a fun that would be a fun uh, level for like the lego game i agree (laughs) well i was gonna say they'll they'll cap off the uh, end of the the level with you know once you get shocked and you're passed out on the ground then you kind of collect yourself you walk all the way back to quill's house and then uh baby yoda eats a frog and then that's the end of the level (laughs) (laughs) speaking of it it would be just as adorable speaking of the walking i love the cinematography on the sequences where they're walking to quill's house Mm -hmm. but i also couldn't help but think what happened to the blur that he had this is a moment where i was like did quill take the blur i think he did I think he took it back. Like once he dropped him off, he was kind of like, okay, have a good time. And then I think that's also why the Jawas were taking apart his ship because a lot of time has passed in between him finding the child and then getting back to his ship. At least because he had to walk back. You know what I mean? Because yeah. Quill indicates, he indicates when they walk up there that he thought that Mando was dead. Right. He thought he had died like all the other ones had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he doesn't say how long it's you. been, but he... He, I think he implies that he's like, it's been like, I don't know, a couple days. Like, he's like, well, if he didn't come back by now, you know, he's probably dead. So, oh, well. I do like how Quill never suggests to Mando that he just not bring Baby Yoda in. He suggests that he bring him in alive. Right. Because that would be better. Uh, and then Baby Yoda eats a frog. Right. Yeah. The the frog, the him watching him again with the little subcaption or the little caption at the bottom, like a child cooing. Like him, like chasing the frog around was like just the most adorable, distracting thing throughout that entire, you know, scene. And then ultimately to watch Mando, like, nope, spit that out. 
And then Baby Yoda's like, F you, like, I'm going to eat this thing. And he just swallows it whole. <laughs> is that how Yoda eats? It? Like, is that, I'm imagining Yoda sitting in the, the, the great hall of the Jedi Temple, just tossing this fro- these frogs back and everybody staring at him like, <laughs> like how do you do this? Happening? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't see, I've never seen him have teeth. Like, so I assume he's just got the most acidic stomach. Like you can just swallow whole frogs whole and it's not a big deal. I don't know. I, we don't know enough about the ad- anatomy of, you know, Yoda species. We don't even know <laughs> what they're called. No, we don't. They're just called them Yodas. Yaddle Yoda and then the, this one. Uh, this one. This one. And there yeah. were only two, there were only two that we saw in Legends. Um, Vandor from, I remember Vandor is the one from Knights of the Old Republic or Star Wars the Old Republic. Vandor's in, is the original, uh, the first Knights of the Old Republic. And then there was one in uh, Star Wars the Old Republic. There was just one whose name I can't remember offhand, but I believe it also starts with a V. You know that the, this, the eating the frog actually reminded me of was Jar Jar Binks eating the frog, trying to start to eat the frog in oh my God. Phantom Menace and then spitting it out. There's a lot of parallels with that. You know, him swallowing the frog, still adorable. And Jar Jar Binks, anything he did, is just like, you know, a, a, the, the village idiot, like doing anything. So maybe he could do anything he's... Jar Jar Binks did and it would be cute. Yeah, he could also topple democracy and lead to 20 years of empire. And it would be adorable doing it. Yeah, and it would be adorable. (laughs) And and there'd be much rejoicing. (laughs) I'd be down. Topple the empire, and everyone's still just like, oh, how cute. (laughs) Um, So Quill actually brings up, he's like, uh, you got to negotiate with the Jawas if you want your stuff back, right? And he's like... Mm -hmm no that that's my stuff i don't need to negotiate with them he's like oh trust me it's okay we'll talk to them tomorrow and then we'll 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 get your stuff back you just gotta negotiate so then they start going then the next scene uh to talk to the jawas and there's actually you know for not a lot happening in this episode a lot happens in this scene in particular because this is the first time we other than the lars you know uh, buying r2d2 and uh, c3po from them this is kind of the most jawa like conversating we get and i'm not sure how i feel about them being translated i kind of dug not understand because it's translated sometimes they're not translated other times and i'm i'm kind of not sure how i felt about like some of the scenes i felt like and i felt this way in other scenes where the alien speech was translated uh it was the kubas in episode one i felt the same way they translated some but not others some of the stuff that they bothered to translate I feel like they could have uh, gone without translating because the intent of it is still there. Like the line about the Wookiee. Right. uh, The Jawa actually says the word Wookiee. Right. So that almost might have been funnier if we didn't know what the Jawa was saying. And then he just said Wookiee randomly. Yeah. Like, hey, you're the Timmy (laughs) Wookiee. Yeah. Kind of like Jawa. You just get mad. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I understand why they, I guess I understand why they would, you know, translate some parts and not others, right? Because you still have to cater to the lowest common denominator, like, you know, in terms of, you know, the fandom and getting people to watch and pay for the subscri- uh, subscriptions, et cetera. Right. So not everyone's going to be, you know, die ward, you know, die, uh, sorry, die hard and anal- an- Star Wars anal- analysts and be able to, you know, determine that, like, oh, he's making fun of Mando, like, blah, 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 like, obviously. And your, you know, your mom next next to you is going to be like, what the heck just happened? Like, so I understand the need to translate certain moments and not others. Like, you know, it's a, it's a basically a pandering position to the people that really aren't, don't follow the series or the Star Wars, you know, universe, like, very much. But I understand why they did it. Um, it's not like Klingon. It's not like a language you could actually learn. No, no, literally, it's just you know they you know speak off of a bunch of Babbles. gibberish. Yep. You know, but they what babble. I know they, they babble whatever. Klingon, right? And I'm pretty sure Wook. I really, I don't know. I'm not sure if I believe that you know the Jawa word for Wookie is Wookie, but I don't know. Like, I don't know enough about the Jawa language because it's just a bunch of Hootini, like the whole right. time. Like, well, it's very minion like, like you know, they it's kind of a play yes, on the minions because yeah. they don't really speak, they just babble, they do that kind of like sim talk where uh-huh. it's like, blah, 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 you know, so then they, they're very minion like too because then we get where they're, they're like, well, we know what we want from you if you want your parts back, we want the Suga, 
the suga yeah this yeah oh no, that no that that i definitely i put in my notes because i thought that was the most hilarious thing when they're just they, they shout suga suga oh and uh <laughs> quill is just like oh god yeah um but one of the funnier moments about that scene like well, going back to the disintegrator rifle you know walking up before they even start negotiations like they're walking up and quill's just like they don't seem to like you very much <laughs> And Amanda's just like, well, I did dis- disintegrate a few of them. Right. <laughs> I'm just like, that this is murder. the most Mandalorian what? thing on the planet. <laughs> like, 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 it's just a thing that you do on accident. Like, oh, you know, he doesn't like me because, yeah. you know, I walked into his yard once. Uh, I broke a window on his house by accident. And I disintegrated several of his friends. <laughs> uh, you know, minor stuff. I think he might not like me very much. Mm-hmm. But then Mando kind of pushes back when they ask him to put the the rifle down, and he says, uh-huh. "You know, I'm a Mandalorian. Weapons are part of my religion." Which also made my brain kind of go, "Hmm," because I was already "Hmm," yeah. because I'd never heard of a lot of this stuff before. And he's bringing that up, and I'm like. Where did this come from? See, okay, I, we will find out he, later where it came from. I I read that more as like he was just kind of doing the whole like I I don't want to give up my gun because it's my gun. Like not that it, he didn't. I don't know if he necessarily meant it so literally. Like I don't think he meant like well this is part of my religion. It's just something that you know like Republicans say like when you want to take away their guns, you know they just say that it's not actually a part of their religion. They're just using it as an excuse or like, well, I need to defend myself, you know, kind of thing. So I think that's kind of more kind of the way he was saying it. I mean, I know later on it's explained a little bit better, but at that, in this moment in time, I, that's how I was reading it was kind of just more like he was just being like a gun person, you know? Man yeah. was exercising his second space amendment rights. Right. Oh my God. Guns, they're not going to let the, the awful, uh, What's what's the party that Leia's part of in Bloodline? Uh, it's not the Orgon, Sith. It's the other ones. Yeah, what party? What party is she part of? It's not the centrist because the centrists are the uh, populist. I don't even let those damn populists uh, take away my disintegrator rifles. <laughs> right. No, uh, I mean you know when that that moment when he was like talking about you know his like weapons are part of my religion and blah 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 i think for people that understand you know again going back i'm going to go back to kotor a lot because i really believe wholeheartedly that playing through kotor is probably one of the best things you can do to understand the complexities of the star wars universe like because it just covers so freaking much and especially in the mandalorian universe you learn a lot about the mandalorian history the leadership the weapons uh, armor like the complexities of mandalorian code um how it's you know all based on honor about battle and you know he equated you know that whole thing to republicans and i'm like yeah mandalorians are probably the closest thing to republicans i guess as you can get mm-hmm. in the star wars universe in terms of guns are everything we're gonna kill kill everyone and take take everything from you because we can even in even in canon even in canon like one, they draw a lot of inspiration from Knights of the Old Republic just in general because Dave Filoni is clearly a huge fan of it. Uh, they had stuff from it that's popped up in, in other media like the Hammerhead Corvettes are from Knights of the Old Republic. But even looking at canon, you know, the, the Mandalorians have this interesting complex political structure with Duchess Satine wanting to move them in more of a pacifist direction and you have mm-hmm. Death Watch who is pushing back on it in the Clone Wars. And then obviously, you know, spoilers for the Clone Wars, but we all know it's, we've all seen it. Uh, Duchess Satine dies. Uh, Maul takes over Spoiler. Mandalore <laughs> through Death Watch. And then like maybe Bo-Katan in Rebels is going to come in and she's going to be like Satine, but she's also former Death Watch. It's this, the Mandalorians in, in canon are this intricate, like, multifaceted society. So when Mando said that line about weapons are my religion, and I went, hmm, this is interesting because this doesn't jive with what I know about even Death Watch. Wasn't well, no, like not this. not canon, not canon Mandalorians. Like, but you know, you go back to what you know about right. um, Kotor Mandalorians. It's a it's a very purist 
uh, take, a very purist point of view. Like, so they had the creed, they, they, they ran by the creed and all that, you know, you didn't see them take their, their, you know, their helmets off or anything. They didn't well, talk Candorous, about taking their did. helmets. Can, well, Candorous, that, well, Candorous that was pre, does. that was, well, that was, that was when he was a bounty hunter before right. he went back and became Mandalore. Um, so he kind of gave up the creed and become a bounty hunter. He kind of lost his way, like, and, and stuff like that. So Candorous is another, like, I can talk about that for a while, but I'm not going to, but. I can talk about his lats and his biceps for a while. Uh, what well, I can yeah, talk about. Daddy, you know, like, literally. <laughs> um, but, you know, they don't talk about, you know, not taking their helmets off because of the creed, but everything else lines up with, you know, what Mando espouses about weapons being his religion and, you know, the other purest aspects that you'll learn more about throughout the season. Um, so Mando finally decides to go get the egg for the Jawas. Um, he <laughs> goes up to the creature's cave um, and the creature, you know, he's, he goes in there and a creature wakes up and he starts rolling him around in the mud with the creature outside, which is a mud horn, which we haven't seen. No. And so that was, it was a refreshing, I mean, it was, it was a new thing for me. Like, you know, I've never, I've never seen one. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, exciting to see a new, um, like a new big, big, like boss creature. Um, I loved uh, and noted the horror. We talked about in episode one, we talked about the horror vibes in the Razor Crest. And here they're kind of doing that same thing with the darkness and the the light, the directional light beam and leading up to the revelation of the mud horn. And then, you know, even when we see its eye, we don't, we hear the blaster fire and then Mando comes flying out of the cave like he's just been fired out of a cannon across this mud pit. And then the thing charges out. You know, he's fired off sh- several shots of his blaster. I mean, didn't do anything. I looked up briefly because I wanted to know if we'd seen a mudhorn before. Mm-hmm. The mudhorn is an interesting case because the mudhorn actually reverse went into Legends. It was originated here in this episode of The Mandalorian. And then Star Wars The Old Republic retroactively had it as a mount that came out after The Mandalorian. So Mudhorns are now in canon and Legends, but they were in canon first and have been retroactively put into Legends by being in the Old Republic. Um, yeah, it kind of look. it's weird too, because it's, um, when I was looking at it, it's almost like a prehistoric rhino in a sense, because it has fur, like hair, which I don't ever think of rhinos having fur. I mean, I guess they have, I guess rhinos do have hair on them. But it's not like a lot. Like they almost look like uh, naked cats, you know. Like they have like little, like bits of hair somewhere. But that's about it. I can't really think of a creature that's like that. Yeah, I mean, there. I mean, I think it was kind of more of a. Gosh, I'm trying to think of the the animals we have around now. Like back in the prehistoric era, like the Jurassic era, stuff like that. Like there were more similar creatures, but they had they had hair. I mean, like okay, mammoths. Like you know, elephants today, they don't really have hair. Back in the day, ancestor for mammoths, woolly mammoths, big, furry, like what would be identical to elephants today, minus the much bigger tusks and, and the size. Um, but you know, they right. elves to elephants, you know, they have they don't have any hair. So I mean, it's kind of a parallel between uh, what would be our rhinos and the mud horn. Um, but even the egg was hairy, which was which I found like weird. I was like, that's just gross i don't understand that yeah well i was gonna say before we get to the egg um like we love talking about it uh the flamethrower is absolute shit again he manages Uh, to hit it at least did nothing he did hit it so last time he couldn't even hit it this time he manages to hit the mud horn and it does nothing whatsoever it is completely useless which is hilarious because the thing is covered in hair you would think the flamethrower would work but it is such a useless weapon yeah i mean and for the flamethrower not to work on the mud horn i mean i guess it wouldn't be as surprising because especially the mud horn sleeps in that mud filled cave and that, that mud horn is gonna be pretty wet like and it's got real thick fur and it's huge like so you know his little wrist you know flamethrower 
against that thing isn't really going to do much of anything. We always think the flamethrower is so cool, but we've been sort of highlighting how every time the flamethrower is used in the show, it's kind of useless. It's such an iconic weapon to Boba Fett. We think, oh, he's so cool because he has a flamethrower. And then we get to the Mandalorian and it's like, no. <laughs> no, well, it actually kind of sucks. Oh, oh well, I was going to say is he doesn't need a flamethrower because he has a magical baby to help him now. <laughs> <laughs> Because the, uh, you know, as the Mudhorn's going to make his final, you know, charge at Mando, because he's basically just giving up because he pulls out his little knife and he's like, all right, I got this. <laughs> this tiny ass little knife is going to help me. And then he charges and then we get a shock because the Mudhorn starts floating. Watching him levitate, I was just like, oh, holy crap. I mean, Dave Filoni and like everyone else, like they knew like how to keep us on the edge of our seas, just, you know. Uh, to lead you right to the very end of like these episodes and you know when you saw that thing just start levitating like we all knew like oh my god like he's force sensitive and he's is this tiny little thing but he can lift a mud horn off the ground i did also like how yes he does this very cool thing of lifting the mud horn off the ground but it's clearly physically exhausting for him mm-hmm. it's a thing with the force and the way you have to deploy it in your story that you have to make sure that you're not having, you're not doing the force unleashed. You're not having your force user be so overpowered right. that they can just wreck every challenge that you put in front of him. There has to be limitations to it. Uh, in you know, we saw in the original trilogy, Luke had very obvious limitations to what he could do with the force in Empire Strikes Back. Like he had to struggle really hard at that point just to pull the lightsaber out of the ice and by the end of it you know we get the sense of his journey over time you know we had to kind of build up to that and there's limitations and even Anakin you know in the prequels when you had the Jedi and Anakin in particular there was still things where they would get knocked around or they would face things that they would face other force users they would face situations like the Geonosis arena where they're just so overpowered by the battle droid forces that you know, their awesome magic stuff can't do it forever. So I think it speaks to a lot of the the puppeteering and the craft on display that, uh, you know, they're able to convey this sense that he's struggling and he's holding it up. And then Mando just knifes the thing with his tiny little knife and just, it's dead. Right. It died. I'm like, (laughs) what? It's very weak in the neck, obviously. (laughs) Where did this come from? Yeah, that was the weakest, like, that was the most anticlimactic death, like, post Baby Yoda doing that. Like, because he passed right out, like, it's, like once he gave all the energy he had, like, he gave it everything. Yeah, he must have stabbed him in, like, an artery or something, because, like, he, right. you know, he just kind of, like, goes, oh, I'm dead. I mean, if you I knew the anatomy of a mudhorn, like, right. fairly <laughs> intimately, and knew exactly where to stab it, with, it would, essentially, to a mudhorn, would be a toothpick. That, that moment, I was, like, Nah. Uh-uh. Well, he gets uh, the spoils of his trouble because he gets the hairy egg, the hairy suga, <laughs> the hairy suga. 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 I'm, I'm yeah. gonna order. I was talking about. Uh, I'm gonna end more sentences with "I have spoken" because I feel oh like more guys uh, could be doing that. Right. Now I'm gonna go to brunch. I'm gonna order suga instead suga. and see what they give me. Right. That little gay waiter's going to look at you like, what did you say? Like, I said, Suga, bitch. Maybe you're done with bottomless mimosas, sir. Well, <laughs> you managed to find the bottom. <laughs> well, uh, when they when he finally gets back to uh, Quill and the um, Jawas, they act like they are getting bottomless mimosas because once he presents them with the egg, they freak out. And I, I wasn't... Okay, so I don't know what I was expecting when he gave them the egg. I mean, I guess it, it just it's obvious that they were gonna eat it, but at the same time, like I wasn't expecting the them to just go, Yay, we got it. Yay, we we eat it. Now we're 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 done. Like you can have your parts back. Like that's it. They just wanted a snack. Just wanted wanted the I guess bottomless mimosa that was in there. That's what it looked like, the little orange stuff that they're eating, the yolk of the egg, I guess. Right. I mean, it's pretty It's pretty much the gays at brunch sharing a, you know, a pitcher of mimosa. Like, that when they cut the egg open and they're all taking turns dipping their heads in the oak, 
So literally, like that's the gaze, just you know, passing around the pitcher. Like, <laughs> but, I mean, the, like, that was probably the most. I mean, I didn't not expect it because I think the Jawas, like you know, in their you know complexity and their you know sophistication that we I think we know they have. I mean, they're little you know little tiny barbarians, and then they cut it off and they all just went ham in it. And uh, again, in the most adorable fashion with their little voices. It's interesting the more we see because nobody ever really goes into like Jawa culture and they don't bother to explore it. I kind of like it that way. So when they do these things, I'm like, that makes sense. Right. That, that tracks. I, okay. I don't know. Right. You're like, I, I accept it. It's it's fact. And I I, I, uh, I like the um, I like the line that Quill gives uh, to Mando and he says, uh, you know, I'm, you know, what took you so long or whatever. And he's like, I'm surprised you waited or some, something along those lines. <laughs> um, well, so once, uh, you know, everything's said and done, he gets his parts back and Quill's like, I'll help you uh, fix your ship. Um, which I was like, okay, he's going to do this in like a day. Like Mando's like, this is going to take like six weeks to finish, you know, with just me. And then Quill's like, not if you get to work, bitch, like start working. Right. He's like, I'm a worker <laughs> bee. I know what I'm talking Quill- about. Quill is every manager I've ever had where it's like, well, it won't take so long if you would just get off your ass and do your job. Uh, I I did like the montage is such a great way to get us to really understand how much Mando loves the Razor Crest. I like how the what seems to be a a running joke or what I guess will start being a running joke uh, with starting with this episode is that the ship's always going to be effed up at some point so it's like it's kind of like that joke that we we were talking about the millennium falcon being a hunk of junk so the beginning episode he's like that's a piece of crap i don't want to take that we all hire a taxi this one it's obviously it's been destroyed by jawas you know and now he has to put it back together so i feel like the running joke now is that it's this piece of crap that is always going to be like stapled back together uh, you know as we go along it's a honda that's basically what it is Let's, yep. let's be real. Like Honda's a bulletproof. You could, you know, you know, take it apart, put it back together fifty times. That thing will still run to about three hundred thousand miles. <laughs> that thing will that thing will carry you. I had a Honda. I think my current car is a Honda, but the one I know that I had before when I was living in Savannah, that one, that one took some punishment, but it kept going. I love the idea of these like dudes in their beat up pickup truck like spaceships that are leaking (laughs) smoke out the back of it and the engine is sputtering flying around the galaxy doing stuff right it's really like a star wars kind of staple you know uh before we get to him kind of like just flying away uh quill says uh or mando asks quill he's like hey you know i could i could use someone of your skill to be on my ship and uh quill basically uh throws it back in his face and he goes yeah slavery's over I've worked a whole lifetime to get to this point. And I'm like, Quill, how old are you? Exactly? Well, we don't know. I, don't, I was going to say, we, we don't, don't know how old Ugnaughts get. So uh, we can assume that he was probably in servitude to the Empire. Like, you know, because I mean, you know, the Ugnaughts were um, pretty embedded into Bespin and the Cloud City. You know, once the empire took over, like you know, they worked for the empire, like period. You know, everybody nothing. worked for the empire, right? But you saw the Ugnaughts everywhere doing everything, so it was nice to get a little bit of a backstory and dialogue from you know that kind of perspective. Some something that Disney is doing with some of theirs, and Legends did this a little bit as well. Uh, but they are trying to show different perspectives on like the droids with L three three seven in Solo or the Ugnaughts with Kuil, like these kind of background servitude kind of uh, groups and trying to get a different perspective and a different angle on them. I do like that, like, obviously we knew Kuil was going to be a major character in the show, but I did like where he was like, nah, I just, I just want to be in my valley doing my thing. I'm retired uh, by... Yeah. I just want to raise my gross... My gross lizard gals. Space gals. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mando right. takes off and flies off and 
I had my notes here. I was I was surprised that it it just cut with the ship there. I expected it to go into hyperspace, and that yeah, would be where it ended. I did think that, but then it's such a Star Wars thing to do in that way. Well, I guess not to spoil any other episodes, but we get that a lot later on. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just a nice, you know, it's just a cut of him, and that's it. Okay, we don't need to know anymore. Like we know where he's going, right? So we know he's going back to Navarro. So it's not really a big deal that we see it because actually he might not need to go to hyperspace. I don't think because it might be in the same system. Possibly. And it's like the implication is that this is all kind of taking place in the same corner of the galaxy that right. also just happens to have other planets we know in it. Uh, because there's, there's that bit again, not to go too far ahead, but there's a several multi-episode arc where he's running along or there's the two episode arc where he's running along without a hyperdrive. Right. So he actually oh, moves that, yeah. several different planets without a hyperdrive. Right. So maybe he's, I just thought that was interesting. Cause I was sitting here, I was watching the episode, mm-hmm. taking my notes. I was like, okay, getting ready for it to go to the hyperspace and that'll be the crescendo. And then we'll get out of here and then we'll get to the concept art. Right. And then it never happened. It just cut straight to the directed by uh, Rick. Uh, I forgot the last name. I, I don't want to say it wrong, but it's F- Fatiyuma. <laughs> Someone's going to read me. Fatiyuma? Rick F- Fatiyuma. I can't, I don't say it right, but I'm, I'm, I apologize to him. Uh, but yes, because he is the only person I believe that does two episodes this season. I think everybody else just gets one. So he's the only I one. I believe, believe, don't quote me on this, the X Wing pilots in episode five, I believe he is one of them. Well, once we get there, we'll have to do some. We'll, we'll go over <laughs> in, in that episode who those pilots are. Um, but what did you think of his directing style? What did, what did you think of the episode overall as a last note? I thought the cinematography for it was interesting. I thought it was a fun episode. Uh, my my general take on the episode was this episode kind of dispelled notions of what the show was going to be. So episode one set up this really lore heavy mm-hmm. show that a lot was going to happen. It was only eight episodes and then episode two came out and it was like, no, there's stuff happens in the episode that's important, but the primary thing is telling a good character focused story and also having fun. The sand crawler chase does very little to advance the plot, but it's a really fun sequence. Right. Um, the mud horn scene really stuck out. You know, I, to me, it was a very uniquely shot battle scene. Like in, in reality, it was a really simplistic um, scene. You know, he just got tossed around by the mud horn a couple times really terribly shot a flamethrower and a little wrist launcher and they got saved by baby yoda and then stabbed him with a knife like you know in the grand scheme of things a grand scheme of things like you know an unexciting normally would be like an unexciting you know battle sequence but the way that it was shot and um the way you know, the way that the, everything was set up made it very exciting so in hindsight, I guess that's maybe why that his death was so anticlimactic, you know, from being stabbed like by the little knife, because I don't think they wanted to take away from that moment. Right. Like, because the whole episode is geared around the child. Right. Like, so I Almost think. Almost like it's no, the name of the episode or something. Right. <laughs> right. So I think, I think that was a real conscious choice by the director to make the death like not as almost purposely you know anticlimactic because the point of it is to really emphasize that this is the first time you're seeing like his like baby Yoda's powers so I really appreciate the entire build up to that moment and everything along the way was just fun it wasn't necessary like Charles pointed out but it was fun right and it, it, it brings you back to a lot of you know original Star Wars um content like even back from episodes four through six. So I, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it had a good mix of, uh, you know, I think the beginning uh, had a good mix of action and then the middle kind of had a little bit of the comedy and then it ended with a little bit of action. Um, so I think it was a good balanced episode. It was definitely one of the shorter ones. You could almost say it's a filler episode um, in the grand scheme of the, just the story. But I think it has important plot points it's kind of one of those weird episodes where 
you have to watch it to get the full story arc, but you don't need to watch the whole episode to get that point. You could watch like one clip from that episode and it would fill in the the gaps of the story arc for Mando and the child because it's not, like I said, it's not really an important episode other than it is showing us, you know, the child's abilities are starting to come out so we needed to see that just for plot purposes but i do think too that it's important to begin exploring the relationship between you know mando and the child because you know that's going to be the central key theme going forward in this episode even the quieter moments do a great job of building that relationship so i think when we went into it we thought the show was going to be majorly plot heavy but no the the secret twist to the show is that it actually is a character focused show which we'll right. see later on well that's all i have for this episode do you guys have anything else i've covered everything in my notes uh, i have as well so i'm surprised <laughs> okay well um thank you so much for being here and uh going on this little journey with us as our first guest on the podcast uh i think we i think you did a pretty good job well thank you <laughs> I was just about to ask, am I, did I do okay? I'm like, I don't, it was, know. It was fine. I don't know how I'm going to fix the acceptable. format. <laughs> no, it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun to have you on and a lot of fun to, to kind of break up, you know, just Bradley and I sitting here and talking. Right. So thank you so much for taking uh, a little bit of time. I know your job keeps you very busy. So I appreciate you taking the time out to come out and talk Star Wars with us for a little bit. Oh, I loved it. You know, today was a really crappy day in terms of, you know, the actual like, job itself. Like, I'll, I'll tell you about it later. But, you know, it's the highlight of my night has been coming and doing this. So I really, I'm glad y'all had me on. Like, and I was scrambling to get my, get in my hotel room, get my food, eat my chicken fingers. And I'm like, I told, I ran into the pilot in the elevator and I'm like, I have to do this, this pod, cor- this um, Star Wars podcast. Like, so I need to get my food and get back to my room and eat <laughs> so I can do this. Yeah, good. No, keeping yeah. with the spirit of the child, you had chicken tendies for dinner. I had cheeky tendies, yes. Yeah. Buffalo cheeky tendies. Love it. And they were, deli- and they were delicious. You know, or adequate for, you know, a little Marriott hotel. Like. Well, um, I just want to let everyone know that now uh, our podcast is about, uh, I think it's on about six or seven different platforms at this point. So we are... We're on our way. Um, it's it's out there, so it's anywhere you know you get your podcast from. Uh, you can look us up, the Gold Squadron Gaze. Uh, it's on there, so please feel free to download, uh, subscribe, and share it with all your friends and family who either love Star Wars or just love Gaze. Inflict my terrible Star Wars opinions on them. This is how you will show them your love. Right. Um, and uh, that's all. Thanks so much. Bye.